Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Deb Marquardt from the uh, Department of English, and I teach in the MFA program in Creative Writing and Environment. We're the main sponsors of this symposium. And I just wanted to ask the uh, faculty and students from the MFA program to stand up and be acknowledged. They've all been sort of working together for this event, so just for a second. All right, thank you so much <laughs> for all your work. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you to c for coming out tonight with that uh, humongous moon hanging in the sky. It's terrifying, isn't it? Um, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. I wanted to uh, point to the schedule. We've got a full day of events for tomorrow, starting with um, a documentary film at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, and a director's talk with Noah Hutton, who's here, and um, a reading at 1 o'clock with Patricia Smith, a wonderful poet. Uh, 2 to 3, we've got a panel discussion with Ben Percy and uh, a live performance, music performance in the afternoon, a sweets reception, and then sort of culminating tomorrow night with uh, a reading by Rick Bass. So we've got a really great full day tomorrow. I hope some of you come out. Um, I, I wanna take a second to thank the sponsors. We uh, wouldn't have been able to do this if we hadn't gotten uh, a little startup money from the, um, not a little startup, it was a significant um, portion of money from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So we really wanna thank them. We also got a, a major grant from Humanities Iowa, and so we just really want to thank them. Ames Public Library partnered with us, um, and we had the kickoff event down there last night with our own Mary Swander. The Creative Writers Milieu, which is the, um, the organization on campus that tries to promote creativity and the arts on campus. Um, the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by GSB. Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities, the Departments of, of Philosophy and Religious Studies, the LAS Miller Lecture Fund, the Bioethics Program, and the Department of English, the Leopold Center, the Henry A. Wallace Endowed Chair for Sustainable Agriculture, the Department of Geological and Atmospheric Sciences, the Department of Natural Resource Ecology Management, the Departments of Landscape Architecture and Community and Regional Planning, the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology, and the Departments of Environmental Science and Environmental Studies. We're really proud to have so many um, co-sponsors for these events, and we hope that it's a way to create a kind of partnership and a conversation across the campus and across the region. Um, just a couple other things, and then I'm gonna invite uh, Anna Keener up here to invite, to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, the bookstore is over there. Uh, they have books from, I believe, all or most of our speakers for the symposium. There is also a sign-up sheet for Humanities Iowa. We'd like to know, um, you know who's here so we can stay in touch with you. So please, um, if, you, if you feel like it, go ahead and sign up over there. Um, so without further ado, I'd uh, like to ask Anna Keener, who is an MFA graduate student, to come up and introduce tonight's speaker. Welcome. So glad to see you all. Um, first to our sponsors, the faculty of the Creative Writing Program, Iowa State University, and everyone who is involved in a symposium, a big thank you. Uh, this is a, a rare and wonderful opportunity, and we're so grateful for all your work, especially Deborah. Okay. Um, Terry Tempest Williams is with us today. It's very exciting, and she's going to share some of her stories with us. Um, in case you don't know her, she's from Utah, which is a land of erosion and precious water um, where there's some sand that still glows atomic. Uh, she has deep Mormon roots and a strong citizen's tongue. She is the author of 15 books, including Refuge, An Unnatural History of Family and Place, Desert Quartet, and Leap. She um, has several awards, including the Robert Marshall Award from the Wildness Society, um, the Distinguished Achievement Award from the Western American Literature Association, the Lennon Literary Fellowship, and a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship in Creative Nonfiction. Her work has been published in Orion Magazine, The New Yorker, 
the New York Times, and she is presently teaching as the Montgomery Fellow at Dartmouth. Among her many achievements, she has mushed with uh, sled dogs in Alaska. She's eaten roadkill. She has... Um, she has also been in prison several times for civil disobedience, and she has adopted a son from Rwanda. I just met her yesterday, but it is easy to tell that she lives by example, showing us that it is a writer's responsibility to live by his or her convictions. Her most recent book, Finding Beauty in a Broken World, is a reflection of a positivity and love that seems to well up from her like a spring. For everyone, who is wilting under the oppression of negativity. She is desert rain. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the heartland to Terry Tempest Williams. Good evening. Thank you, Anna. Who are you? That was such a generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate our shared affinity for the American Southwest. Anna's from New Mexico, and we had such a wonderful time discussing our own home ground last night. It's a pleasure and privilege to be part of this conference, both celebrating and considering finding beauty in a broken world. Just um, before we started, uh, Danielle Worth introduced me to Bruce Erisman and Marlene. And it, it, you know, this is so thrilling to me to f hear that there literally are silver-haired bats in the neighborhood um, who normally would be found in Arkansas. So who knows um, who we live among? Just two weeks ago, I had an appointment with a painted bunting at 6.45 a.m. at a friend's feeder in Maine. And, you know, when you look at their distribution map, they're all the way down to Florida and into Costa Rica. And he appeared like a dream at 6.43 a.m., stayed for seven minutes feeding on sunflower seeds, and then um, disappeared between this crease of shadow and light. And suddenly all I was left was with my longing. So I love hearing about these unexpected sightings where we get to celebrate the individual rather than just the species. Deb Marquardt, um, where are you? I just saw you. Yeah, thank you for bringing us here together to break bread, for organizing this gathering where we can really talk about the things that matter most to us. And it's a privilege to be here with Patricia Smith and Noah Hutton, um, just wonderful artists among us. And to Dean, to Ben, to Steve, to the faculty, to my sister, I want to say in crime, Mary Swander, um, it's just a joy to be here at Iowa State. There's magic here. Um, last night at dinner with Steve Pett and Anna, I met Melanie Cowley, and she was telling me the story of her novel called um, The Healing Cain uh, about Mormons and feminists, and it gave me such courage and hope. And then reading, meeting you, Richard, um, telling me that you greet your community every day at the post office and telling me that when we speak about love, what we're really saying is thank you and please, I won't forget that. And this morning I thought I was simply going downstairs to get a cup of coffee. And when I asked the young woman behind the counter where the sunroom was, she said, let me show you rather than tell. And I thought, that's the first rule of a good writer. And then as we were walking, she talked about empathy, about how it's not only about feeling someone's pain, but experiencing it with them. And then she talked about tears, four kinds. Tears of anger, tears of sorrow, tears of joy, and onions. <laughs> and I love that. And I loved how she said, you know, we don't want to cry. We're afraid to cry, but our body needs it in order to be cleansed. 
And then this moon, this exquisite full moon. Uh, last night coming in, watching that moonlight pouring in over these snow-laden plains in the heartland. It felt more oceanic than land. And I think this is one of the most exotic places I've ever been. And I'm really here because of my love for Rick Bass, who is my Western brother and family. Today he spoke of hunger and of beauty. He used the word pretty. Yes, Rick, exactly, pretty. And tomorrow night you're going to hear the most beautiful, pretty sentences. Thank you. Um, today we talked about, in one of our discussions, words from Martin Luther King Jr. And as Anna said, I'm teaching at Dartmouth and I've been looking at some of the um, cultural aspects that have happened at that school so that I can have some frame of reference for my students. And one of the things that was so astonishing is on Martin Luther King Day, I learned that he spoke there on March 23rd, 1962. And before I begin my reading, I just wanted to read his exact words because never have they felt more urgent or more true. He said this, you know there are certain technical words within every academic discipline which soon become stereotypes and cliches. Every academic discipline has its technical nomenclature. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in modern psychology. It is the word maladjusted. Maladjusted. This word is already the pride of modern child psychology, and suddenly we all want to live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But I say to you in my conclusion that there are certain things within our social order and in the world to which I'm proud to be maladjusted, to which all men of goodwill must be maladjusted until the good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence. In the day when Sputniks and explorers are dashing throughout space and guided ballistic missiles are carving highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can win a war. The alternative to disarmament, the alternative to suspension of nuclear tests, the alternative to strengthening the United Nations and disarming the whole world may well be a civilization plunged into the abyss of annihilation. So I say the world is in desperate need of maladjusted men and women, maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of injustices of his day could cry out in words echoing across the centuries, quote, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Unquote. As maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who in the midst of an eye amazingly adjusted to slavery, had the vision to see that this nation could not exist half slave and half free. As maladjusted as Thomas Jefferson, scratching across the pages of history, words lifted to cosmic proportions, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I believe that through such maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. If we will do this, we will be participants in the creation of a new society, the creation of a great America." Unquote. I mean, you just realize um, the words that have been spoken um, that not only show us what is possible but what is necessary. Finding beauty in a broken world is making a personal commitment as a writer, as a citizen, to be a participant in the creation of this new society, in the creation of a new kind of human being. And I feel like that's what we've been discussing today. Empathy. I hear William Sloan Coffin's words, the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Today, just while I've been here, I received a letter from a friend of mine, Mariah Hughes, 
and I asked if I could read this to you because I think it's so important as writers, and I say this to you um, specifically the MFA students. We talked today about how there's no separation between a writing life and a life engaged. And we need to really think about where we are now, today, at this point in time, so we can truly be present, because if we know where we are, then we know who we are. And conversely, if we know who we are, then we know where we are. I think so often when we realize how words fail us, and in thinking about how do we find beauty in a broken world, I think today after reading this letter, I thought, so this is how we create beauty in a broken world. My friends Nick and Mariah just lost their daughter to suicide. Emily Sichterman, she was 27 years old. And when I heard that news, I had no words. As a writer, there were no words. And then Mariah sent me this letter today, and she said, please read these words. This is from Jeffrey Lent, who actually is a writer, a friend of theirs. They own a bookstore in Blue Hill, Maine. He wrote of many books, but one in particular, A Peculiar Grace. I just want to share this with you as a prelude to the reading I'm going to share with you tonight, because I think it has everything to do with empathy. January 30th, 2010. Dear Mariah and Nick, I was a young man 10 days shy of 23 the night my father died. Outside the hospital in the cold December night, my grandmother turned abruptly and grasped my upper arms, shaking me without, I think, realizing she was doing so. As she told me, a mother should never have to bury a child. Her swift anger came and was gone, but surprised me, even as I knew I didn't fully understand what she was saying. Many years later, with two young daughters of my own, I'm much closer to understanding it, close enough to pray I'll never inhabit it, and wise enough to know that such an event is beyond my control. My heart aches for you. Your letter and newspaper announcement are a lovely homage, not only to a young woman, but to your Emily. Not a page or a book or a river or any other metaphor, but both a life itself and a life from and of the two of you. You will and are finding peace and love and support from all who know you, who knew, even however briefly, Emily, and this is how we proceed. Our rational minds tell us that her short time upon this earth enriched it, from within her eyes and for those who knew her, simply for her being. Our rational minds can even find sympathy from and empathy for the many others who have experienced such a devastation. Although I'm sure you know it well and have felt it in the grips and hugs and tears of family and friends, let me tell you, in the event no one has, that the clench of fisted rage and grief knotted in your chests and brains, hearts and souls are also well and good, testimonial and sacrament for Emily. If not on the day she was born, very quickly you realized you'd been entrusted with the care of a singular person, someone already there coming forward into life. Emily, 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 sing of her. Sing of her life, of her time here with you. Sing even as you are bent and clutched with all of the sorrows that flow over you. Sing those sorrows out into the hole in your life to Emily, for such is the power of love, so terrible and beautiful that we can barely stand. Sing silent if you must, for finally there are no words. With love, Jeffrey. For the next 45, 50 minutes, um, I have the luxury, thank you, Deb, um, for reading from Finding Beauty in a Broken World. And I haven't read from this book in um, a year. And I was struck by how far away it feels. And yet, um, I think th that after we write a book, it takes on its own life. And as the writer, you have to re-inhabit that landscape. So I re-inhabit this with you. These fragments I have shored against my ruins. The cosmos works by harmony of tensions like the lyre and bow. And so it was I entered the broken world, turning shadow into transient beauty. 
once upon a time we knew the world from birth. We watched the towers collapse. We watched America choose war, the peace in our own hearts shattered, how to pick up the pieces, what to do with these pieces. I was desperate to retrieve the poetry I had lost, standing on a rocky point in Maine, looking east toward the horizon at dusk, I faced the ocean. Give me one wild word. It was all I asked of the sea. The tide was out, the mud flaps exposed. A gull picked up a large white clam, hovered high above the rocks, then dropped it. The clam broke open, and the gull swooped down to eat the fleshy animal inside. Give me one wild word to follow. And the word the sea rolled back to me was mosaic. Her name is Luciana. She is my teacher. Her work is unsigned, anonymous, like the mosaicists before her who created the ancient mosaics they adorn the sacred interiors of this quiet town. She conducts the workshop in the traditional manner outlined centuries ago. I am an apprentice. The tools required a hammer and a hardy. The hardy is similar to a chisel and is embedded in a tree stump for stability. A piece of marble, glass, or stone desiring to be cut is held between the forefinger and thumb of the left hand placed perpendicular on the hardy. The hammer that bears two cutting edges gracefully curved is raised in the right hand with a quick blow a tessera is born, the essential cube in the creation of a mosaic. Her name is Luciana. She is a mosaicist in the town of Ravenna. She has no belief in invention or innovation. It has all been done before, she says. There are rules. One, the play of light is the first rule of mosaic. Two, the surface of mosaics is regular, even angled, to increase the dance of light on the tessera. Three, tessera are irregular, rough, individualized, unique. Four, if you're creating a horizontal line, place the tessera vertically. If you're creating a vertical line, place the tessera horizontally. Six, the line in mosaic is supreme. Seven, the background is very important in emphasizing the mosaic pattern. Eight, there is perfection in imperfection. Nine, many colors are used to create one color from afar. Ten, the distance from which the mosaic is viewed is important to the overall design. Eleven, the play of light is the first and last rule of mosaic. Luciana will tell you that once you learn the rules of ancient mosaics, only then can you break them. She places a gold piece of glass between her finger and thumb on the hardy and holds the hammer at the base of its wooden handle. Ting! She strikes the gold smalty into the exact shape she desires. You can learn this technique in 15 minutes, she says. It will take you a lifetime to master it. Mosaic is a conversation with what is broken. I went back for the disembodied arms with the hands clasped in prayer, but they were gone. My eyes stretched, searched the table in the Arezzo market. I should have bought them, 15 euros. Clearly it wasn't about the money, but something had frightened me. I turned around and asked the outdoor vendor who was sitting on a stool against the stucco wall if he still had them. He shook his head. In a quick exchange of Italian, he told me they had just been sold. Who to? He couldn't remember. Something had stopped me. This was the impulse I had to trust. Who knew what these broken hands, arms with devoted hands held? Could I in good conscience have lived with them suffered from their source, never knowing the face that looked down upon them, much less the body of flesh painted plaster to which they belonged? No doubt these were fragments of a saint perched on an abandoned altar, perhaps stolen. One never knows the power of such things. No, I walked away. Now, wandering through the outdoor market, I wondered who had them. Do I dare to admit that my own hands are those locked in that perpetual gesture of pleading and desire, a disembodied hand clutching a pencil in prayer? Writers break 
black letters out of lead and line them up on white sheets of paper and ask others to read the sentences we have created for ourselves. In Italy, cypress trees speak of vertical time in a layered landscape. There is nothing here that has not been tampered with and tempered by human history. It is a deeply foreign sensibility to my mind permanently placed in the desert of the American West. There is nothing I desire here but those disembodied arms with hands in perpetual prayer. This is what I know as a writer devoted to words. It is all I know in the loneliness of waiting for the right line to appear. His name is Marco De Luca. He is a mosaicist in the town of Ravenna. Unlike the artists before him who created ancient mosaics that embellished the sacred interiors of this quiet town, his work adorns galleries, not ceilings. De Luca builds geologic landscapes with cubes. Each tessera that he cuts with his hammer and hardy becomes a tiny block of earth, a drop of water, a shimmery note in the composition of light. Tension builds through size and compression. Some tessera are orderly, small, square. They create lines like sentences of four-sided words. Moon wake over wave blue, rose fish deep, sand seen near. Cube swim gold, next rock face. Leaf fell fall, land dirt held. His name is Marco De Luca, and he can bend stone with his eyes. We meet by chance. He invites me to his studio. He leans against the white stucco wall. He is tall, he is dark, his intensity is unnerving. He walks over to a turnstile loaded with stones where bowls of small tea are also found. He brings a wooden box over to me. Hold out your hands. He places a dozen glass cubes into my open palms. He puts the box down, then picks up a pitcher and pours water over the glass squares in my cupped hands. The colors begin to speak, dazzling rich hues, red, maroon, purple, brown, black, gold. These are ancient tessera from the Church of San Vitale, he says, that are over 500 years old. They fell from the ceiling during the war and were in the safekeeping of an old restorer who gathered them up on hands and knees and kept them here in this box. Before he died, he gave them to me. He put some in his own hands, and pours water over them as well. He holds them up to my ear. Listen, he says. Who will give up this world? The catalog of forms is endless. No one sees everything. I am looking for a way to vocalize, perform, act out, address the commonly felt crisis of our time. These are spiritual exercises. I went back for the disembodied arms with the hands clasped in prayer, but they were gone. Fragmentation and breaking up is indeed the essence of the 20th century. We are now living in the 21st century. We have no compass to reorient ourselves. Memory is redundant. Didn't we plant the seeds? Weren't we necessary to the earth? There is an old saying that when you change your life, you also change your ideas. I came to this workshop in Ravenna because of a word, mosaic. Unaware of the landscape I was entering, I came to the mosaic workshop in Ravenna to learn a new language with my hands. People talk about medium. What is your medium? My medium as a writer has been dirt, clay, sand, what I could touch, hold, stand on, and stand for, earth. My medium has been earth, earth in correspondence with my mind. Here in the village of Ravenna, a continent away from where I live, I am indeed learning a new language, but it is very different from the one I imagined. I now look to my hands. Mosaic is a way to organize your life. Luciana gives us her last instructions. Making mosaics is a way of thinking about the world. Her final words to us, mosaics are created out of community. The dream I had was this. 
I was walking along a dike that held the river in place. It was close to sunset. Up ahead, I saw a small figure that appeared to be standing. It was a prairie dog. It didn't move. Finally, we were facing each other. The prairie dog spoke. I have a story to tell. In the American West, one of the predominant myths that still lives is that of the rugged individual. The prairie dog stands for community. We are fragmenting ourselves by destroying our community. Utah once understood this concept in the beginning of its statehood. We are forgetting our communal roots as we are developing our communities. The prairie dog lives because of community. More than 200 species of wildlife have been associated with prairie dog towns, with over 140 species benefiting directly. Bison, pronghorn, burrowing owls, and rattlesnakes among them. Niles Eldridge, in his field guide to the sixth extinction, wrote in the New York Times Magazine, December 6, 1999, that the Utah prairie dog is one of the six species identified worldwide as most likely to become extinct in the 21st century. Prairie dogs are Pleistocene mammals who've survived the epics, epic changes through time. Standing on their hind legs in the big wide open, what do they see? What do they smell? What do they hear? They hear the sound of a truck coming toward their town, the slamming of doors, the voices, the pressure of feet walking toward them, from inside their burrow, they see the well-worn sole of a boot, now the pointed toe of the boot, kicking out the entrance to their burrow. Blue Levi's bending down, gloved hands flicking a lighter, the flame, the heat, then the hands shoving something burning inside the entrance. Something is burning. They back up further down their tunnel, smoke now curling inside the darkness as the boot is kicking the dirt inside, closing their burrow, covering their burrow, tamping their entrance shut. They are scurrying down, 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 around. They cannot see what they smell is fear. They cough and wheeze. Their eyes are burning. Their lungs are tightening. They cannot breathe. They try to run, turn, nowhere to turn. Every one of them trying to escape, to flee. But all exits and entrances of their burrows have been kicked closed. The toxic smoke is chasing them like a snake, an invisible snake, herding them toward an agonizing death of suffocation, strangulation, every organ in spasm until they collapse onto each other's bodies, noses covered in blankets of familial fur, families, young and old, slowly, cruelly gassed to death. The truck drives away. The American flag is flapping in the wind, the red, white, and blue banner of the American West that says the rights of private property takes precedence over the lives of prairie dogs who are standing in the way of development. Nearly 400 Utah prairie dogs disappeared in the summer of 1999 at the Cedar Ridge Golf Course in Cedar City, Utah. It is believed they were murdered, gassed to death, Two federal agents investigated the crime. This is a federal criminal offense. Penalties for killing or attempting to kill the federally protected animals range from fines up to $100,000 to one year in prison. Some say locals know who did it and they're glad they did. Others are outraged. Nobody is talking. Both sides offered rewards for the offender's arrest. Cedar City is a small town. The killers were never caught. Iron County Commissioner Jean Roundy said, I think it's a crime against society that a prairie dog can move into your front yard and you can't take care of it. Whose society? Who cares? Only if we understand can we care. Only if we care can we help. Only if we help shall they be saved. Jane Goodall. The prairie dog lives because of community. Destroy the prairie dog, and you destroy a varied world. One day, a shovel unearths a day of its own. A terrible beauty is born. 
everything that happens to us, everything that we say or hear, everything we see with our own eyes or we articulate with our tongue, everything that enters through our ears, everything we are witness to and therefore responsible for, must find a recipient outside ourselves. Everything must be told to someone. At night, putting your ear to the ground, you can sometimes hear a door slam. How many millions lost their homes to clear the ground? How many homeless wandering improvisatory as new deserts move up? The sight made us all very silent. We've got to go underground like seed so that something new, something different may come forth. It isn't time that's required. It's a new way of looking at things. Night season. I think that is a lovely phrase. Being in Iowa, in the prairies, the Great Plains, it's hard to imagine how vast these prairie dog towns were right here, black-tailed prairie dogs, 200 miles wide, 100 miles long. Can you imagine following the stampeding hers, um, herds of bison, aerating their soils afterward, their niche? So what will we lose if prairie dogs disappear from North America? In 1950, government agents proposed to get rid of prairie dogs on some parts of the Navajo Reservation in order to protect the roots of sparse desert grasses and thereby maintain some marginal grazing for sheep. The Navajo elders objected, insisting, if you kill all the prairie dogs, there will be no one to cry for the rain. You can imagine what the government officials thought. The amused officials assured the Navajo that there was no correlation between rain and prairie dogs and carried out their plan. The outcome was surprising only to the federal officials. The desert near Chinchilbido, Arizona became a virtual wasteland. Without the ground turning process of the burrowing animals, the soil became solidly packed, unable to accept paint, rain, hard pan. The result, fierce runoff whenever it rained. What little vegetation remained was carried away by flash floods and a legacy of erosion. If you take away all the prairie dogs, there will be no one to cry for the rain. Why should we care about the fate of a rodent? An animal met many simply see as a varmint. Why should we as citizens of the United States of America with issues of terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, racism, and a shaky economy care about the status and well-being of an almost invisible animal that spends half of its life underground in the western grasslands of this nation. Quite simply, because the story of the Utah prairie dog is the story of the range of our compassion. If we can extend our idea of community to include the lowliest of creatures, call them the untouchables, then we will indeed be closer to a path of peace and tolerance. If we cannot accommodate the other, the shadow we will see on our own home ground will be the forecast of our own species extended winter of the soul. Clay colored monks dressed in discreet robes of fur standing as sentinels outside their burrows, watching, watching as their communities disappear, one by one, their hands raised upward in prayer. And so it was I entered the broken world, Hart Crane. I could never have imagined that after September 11th, how we watch the rhetoric of our country change to one of fear. That in a desperate personal moment, I would have gone down to those waters on the rocky coast of Maine and literally said, give me one wild word and I promise I will follow. And the word that was rolled back to me, the word I heard in my own heart was mosaic. I could never have imagined that after an apprenticeship in Ravenna, Italy, with those ancient mosaics, those bejeweled ceilings, that I would have returned home to the desert of Utah, only to find along that horizon one vertical tessera, 
a Utah prairie dog in that broken landscape. Suddenly, I saw the landscape of my home, an ecological mosaic, broken and beautiful. Nor could I have ever imagined that I would have found myself in Rwanda, literally creating a mosaic out of the rubble of war. My brother Steve passed away in 2005, almost exactly five years ago, from lymphoma. And a dear friend of mine, Lily Ye, a Chinese-American artist, uh, came to visit. She started, maybe some of you know her, she started in Philadelphia in some of the roughest neighborhoods, um, what is known now as the Village of Arts and Humanities. She was asked by one of her dancer friends to help <coughs> re-inhabit some of these um, vacant lots. And there she stood in the center of this community, took a stick, she's about this tall, and drew a circle around her and suddenly there were the children. And they began picking up pieces of glass, shards of glass. And to make a long story shorter, enlisted some of the community members to create mosaics, trees of life out of mosaics, um, an alley of angels, 12-foot Ethiopian angels, so that if the children were ever in trouble, they could stand in front of those angels and there would be people there to help them. She was at an international conference in Barcelona. She heard a man named Jean Bosco, who was from Rwanda, the Rwandan Red Cross, tell the story of the Rwandan genocide, a story we know well, even though we averted our eyes as Americans that in the spring of 1994, April to be exact, a million Tutsis were murdered by hand by Hutu extremists. As he told this story in graphic detail, afterwards she went up and said, how can I help? And John Bosco said to Lily Ye, a community activist and artist, come to Rwanda and you'll know what to do. She did go to Rwanda and she met with the women genocide survivors in the genocide survivors village of Rugorero, very close to the border of the Congo. She sat down with these women and what she heard is that what these women wanted were a proper burial for the bones of their children, of their loved ones. What she saw to her horror were the bones of the children that belonged to these mothers wrapped in fragments, wrapped in swaths of fabric underneath their beds, behind their chairs, even under rocks behind their, their makeshift homes. And so she said, this we can do. And together <coughs> they drew up a design of what a genocide memorial might look like. She came home and enlisted a team of four barefoot artists. And she came to Salt Lake and she said, will you come with me to Rwanda to help build this memorial and be my scribe? And I said, no. I was broken, I didn't want to see any more death. I just thought I can't face what I had no part of solving. Um, we're all complicit in this genocide. I said no, she never took her eyes off of me. I heard myself say yes. I think on some fundamental level, I knew that my own spiritual evolution depended on this. This is what we saw. And I should say this next section is, is not easy. A woman stands at the opening of a descending staircase. Her eyes, her red streaked eyes see inside me as she puts her arm through mine. We kiss each other on either side of our cheeks, one, two, three, Rwandan style. Her eyes, she directs me down to the basement where there is a pyramid shaped glass case of bones rising from the floor of white square tiles. The bones, skulls, femurs, ribs, vertebrae, are organized in rows, columns, piles. You can look through the glass floor of the pyramid case to another floor below, where a single coffin rests. We are told that inside the coffin is the body of a mother holding a child. I saw this woman, a man interrupts. I knew her. For years she was exposed for everyone to see. As we listen to what happened to this woman, what was done to her, the repeated rapes and the violence impaled with a gun. I didn't want to hear it. And now that I had, I couldn't get this image out of my mind. How to erase this violence from my mind? 
Once a witness to brutality seen or heard, we become accountable. More bones, I now see them as prairie dog bones, sorted, cleaned, and categorized. It is the only way I can stay in the basement and not collapse under the magnitude of what has been gathered here. Nayamata. I look up at the ceiling in the church. Holes from grenades appear as stars. Light is streaming down onto the pews, empty pews, rooms full of bones, bags of bones, bulging clothes, sacks of skulls, piles of faded clothing, the altar cloth once white, now brown with blood. 10,000 people were murdered here. Belise, a young woman, 21 years old, is the witness here at Nayamata who tells the story. She shows us where the door was kicked down. She shows us an identity card, Hutu, Tutsi. It came down to this, she says. She tells of those murdered, bodies piled over one another on pews. She tells of how the virgin survived and points to the statue in the sh corner on the shelf, the Blessed Mother, perfectly intact. Beautiful in her ethereal presence, Belize is barely here. She inhabits the past, hunkered in the grasses, nine years old, listening, waiting. Her parents told her to hide in the fields. She remembers the screams, the silences, looking for her parents, searching for her parents, and then the years of wandering. She has come back. This church is now her home, her parents' home. Their bones are in the church. Purple fabric covers coffins. Flowers now dried are draped over the wooden boxes. We descend into what looks like a root cellar. There is just enough light to see that it is filled with coffins covered with purple cloth. Some of the coffins are open. That is not one person, she says, but many persons. Each coffin contains many people. She pauses, whole families. This is a hell of our own making those who killed and those of us who looked away. No surgical strikes, computerized or digitalized by military minds and top gun pilots. The eyes of these killers were on the eyes of who those they killed by hand. One million Tootsies were murdered in 100 days. Their killers were neighbors with farm tools, machetes and hoes, hundreds of skulls, shelves of skulls, 30,000 bodies here at Nyamata. This is what we are told. We are walking inside a mass grave, genocidal tourists, underground. I'm sick to my stomach. All I can see are the whites of Belize's eyes in darkness. I cannot walk any farther down this narrow, damp hallway of bones, shelves and boxes of bones. Belize calls me back. Here, look, the skin has not yet separated from the bones. From the corner of my eye, I see a flesh-fallen hand, disembodied, Below, a large amber cockroach scurries across the cement floor. Inyeze, cockroach, the Hutu name for Tutsi. I emerge out of the cellar, two windows with hands. Hand grips are pulled back over the ceiling of white tiles like transparent wings. Belize is outside, one arm wrapped around her waist, her other hand on her forehead, wiping away sweat. Can one be soaked in sorrow? I sit next to her in the garden. It is impossible to imagine, I say to Belize. It is impossible to accept, she answers. When I see these skulls, I see me. We are sitting on the porch of the house where we will be staying. In candlelight, Lily says, the results of the violence we witnessed today at Nayamada and Natarama is not just outside us, but within us, capable of erupting at any moment. I am sitting against a tree, wishing I could disappear. The physical and psychic assault of Rwanda has deflated me. I close my eyes. Three girls suddenly grab my hands, pull me up, push me toward the school where dozens and dozens of children follow, running, laughing, and tugging at my skirt. Megan, another barefoot artist, is behind me with her own group of children. Desperate to stem the chaos, I sit down on the ground, making a circle with my hands. Miraculously, the children sit down with me. And then, with Louis Gakumba's help, 
he is our translator, 22 years old. They move back to enlarge the circle so more children can join us. My name is Terry, I say, then clap, looking at the child sitting next to me. My name is Olive, she says, and claps. My name is Jean-Claude, clap. My name is Vincent, clap. The tempo picks up, my name is Yvonne, clap. And so the children's names become a game, a cadence, a rhythm, moving energetically through the circle like electrical current. And then spontaneously, the children begin to sing. Olive sings with a deep, haunting voice. More songs emerge, many of them Christian songs the children learned in church. Suddenly, the children start clapping their hands, calling my name. I don't know what they want. Louis turns to me and says, they want you to sing. Sing them a song. Teach them a song. My mind, in a panic, goes blank. A song? I can't remember any song. Finally, with Louis' translation, I say, OK, this is a very silly song. It's about a food called Jello. I jiggle my body, and they jiggle theirs. All of us are laughing. I begin to sing. Oh, the big red letter stands for the Jello family. Oh, the big red letter stands for the Jello family. It's Jello, yum, yum, yum. Jello pudding, yum, yum, yum. Jello tapioca pudding. Try all three. The children are hysterical. At me, at my singing, and I cannot believe that here I am in Rwanda, and the only song that comes to me is a Mormon camp ditty that I learned when I was eight years old. Louis tries to explain to the children what Jello is. He looks at me completely puzzled. What is it? What should I say? Tell them it looks like a fat man's belly that jiggles when he's laughing. Tell them it's green and comes in cold square cubes. Louis raises his eyebrows. Tell them it's like squishy candy and you can eat it with a spoon. Whatever Louis tells them, the children are rolling with laughter. Megan moves us forward, thank God, with a chant of her own. We enter a musical trance in the dreamscape of afternoon heat. The African sun beats like a drum, moving one tiny girl. She jumps to the center of the circle and dances with her eyes closed. She twirls and twirls. The children clap as she rises and falls, being blown up and down by the wind. Other girls join her, their hands in prayer. More begin to dance and sing on the edges of bones impatient bones that are crying to be buried. Louis whispers in my ear, no one can rob these children of their joy. At the genocide site, where there are more children still, Lily calls them together. All eyes are on her. She picks up two rocks and raises the lava stones high above her head. She then ritualistically places them down by her feet beneath a line of twine used to mark the boundaries of the site. She makes a rectangle with her hands, points to the children, and claps her hand. The children understand and begin gathering rocks and placing them below the twine. Within minutes, the children have enclosed the sacred space with lava stones. The boundaries of the memorial are set. When I asked Lily how she had thought of this, she said, smiling, I'm Chinese. I know a workforce when I see one. <laughs> what I can tell you is that in the course of these years, the genocide memorial was built, finished, created that a bone room was secured, and that a proper burial for the children of these mothers and their loved ones was done. That Hutus, Tutsis, Rwandans, and Americans side by side literally created a mosaic after the, out of the rubble of war. We're taught that beauty is optional, that art is peripheral, but I, what I learned by this work in Rwanda is that art is not optional, that it's not peripheral, but it is a strategy for survival. Art becomes a spark for social change. The last part that I want to read to you is about Louis. And Louis, as I mentioned, was our 21-year-old translator. Um, he was my eyes, my ears, my heart. Everything that I saw, learned, took in was really through the generosity of Louis. So I'm going to read three pieces, a very short commentary, and then close this reading. Today, the first thing Louis says as he jumps into the back of the Red Cross vehicle that takes us from Gisenyi to Ruggiero is, I have my answer. 
It took me by surprise. Yesterday, I had asked him what he had learned through the work of translation, and he told me, I will tell you tomorrow. In all honesty, I had forgotten that I had asked him the question. There is something beyond language, he says. There is something else. What? I ask. Hunger. You are hungry to understand. You are hungry to be understood. But without translation, we just talk to ourselves and no one eats. He pauses. How can I say this? As a translator, I see hunger on both sides. I can create a place where these two hungers can meet. He stares out the window at the landscape as it flashes by. Quote, birds have their own language. Cows have their own language. If there was a bird who could hear a cow, I mean really understand what the cow was saying, then that bird could stand between cows and birds and be the mediator between these two different groups. And perhaps they could help each other. That's how I see it. Without Louis's capacity to listen to, understand, and translate what is being said, I have no access to the hearts of the Rwandans with whom we are working. Words are our tools for understanding and misunderstanding. Words can ignite and incite, kill and cull, and at the same time, words can create bridges between cruelty and compassion. A chain of words becomes a history. Neighbors, Hutu, Tutsi, colonialism, identity, power, resentment, propaganda, a plan, a purpose, a genocide. You ask me what I'm learning, he said. I did. What I am learning is that if I love what I'm doing, then that translates to a love for the one who is speaking and those that are listening. This is what I mean when I say there is something else, something else at play and at work. He looks at me intently. I think you know what I am saying. I look at him, this unexpected companion who has become my eyes, my ears, my voice, entering my bloodstream in ways unknown to me. It is deeper than just trading words, he says. So we left, and Louis was the only person I met in Rwanda that didn't ask for something. And as I was leaving, he gave me a gift. It was a pair of shoes, turquoise beaded sandals. And he said, when you wear these, I walk with you. I said to him, Louis, what do you want? What's your dream? And he said, maybe someday after I've paid for my own brothers and sisters to go to school, I would love an education. And over those two years that passed, we worked really hard to try and find him a school. We did um, Salt Lake Community College. Everything was in play. We found a sponsor. Everything was ready to go but his visa. And his visa was turned down three times for reasons I won't go into because it's a long, involved story, but it had to do with the fact that Louis had no land, no money, nothing. How could he? He's a genocide survivor. Um, finally, the consulate from the State Department called and said, would you be willing to sign on his um, passport should anything bad happen? You would be held responsible. And I said, of course. Brooke and I go back to Rwanda. I called the State Department and says, where, said, you know, where are we on Louis Gakumba's visa? And she said he picked it up yesterday. Brooke and I went down to the village, and unbeknownst to us, we found ourselves in a transfer ceremony with his parents. His father was a Congolese prince um, who abandoned them during the war. Um, his mother, a Rwandan Tutsi. His father had returned, turning shadow into transient beauty. We are his biological parents, Louis's father says to Brooke as he takes his hand in his. Now you are his developmental parents. Brooke and I catch each other's eyes in a look we have never shared before in three decades of marriage. Louis has brought his parents, Michelle Kinjunja and Kagogori Anosiata, and his older brother Michael to Mama Chukua's house to meet us. You must educate him and be devoted to him, his mother says quietly, holding Louis's hand with both of hers as she sits next to him. I cannot express myself. I am sorry. I have not the words. Brooke and I sit directly across from Mama Odia and Michelle with our friends gathered around us. The atmosphere is formal, ceremonial. I am perched somewhere between shock and denial as it slowly dawns on me that they are transferring their son to us. 
Mama Odia is trusting me with her beloved boy. I am not prepared. There is a butterfly in my heart. Developmental parents. We chose not to be parents. We have no children. My eyes flashed to Chris Noble, a father twice, one of our oldest friends, who is wearing the biggest coyote grin from the desert. I also see his tears. Louis's father explains their genealogy. His father was a Congolese king. He was a prince with great land holdings and many cows. They lost everything in the war, everything. His wife, Louis's mother, is Tutsi. She fled to the Congo in 1959 after the first genocide and stayed. In 1994, her brother was part of the RPF and helped Mama Odia cross the border back to Rwanda, moving from the Masisi in the Congo from one refugee camp to another until they finally settled in a small house with their mother in Ruangari, one room, all of them. Mama Odia had her seven children with her. Louis's father turns and speaks to Michael. Michael says, my father wants you to know that he stole his wife from another suitor by paying eight cows for her because she was so beautiful. This was new information to both sons. Mama Odia is indeed lovely as well as humble and refined. She looks down at her lap. She is one of the most striking women I have ever seen, elegant in her features, great dignity in her carriage. Her beloved son, the younger son, who has supported her family since he was 10, is leaving for America. I cannot imagine her thoughts. We would later learn that Mama Odia's husband, Michel, abandoned her and their children during the war, that he had two other wives who tried to poison her, and that it was her many Hutu friends with whom she had shared her land to cultivate food for their families who ultimately helped her and her family survive. On the night they were to be killed, she had been warned by the Hutu women. She gathered her children together and said a prayer. She told them to be kind to every person they met and sent each of them in a different direction with the name of a woman who she promised would come find them. Louis survived in the bush for several months, eating spoiled avocados, whatever he could find. And then one day, the woman his mother had told him to watch for at a market spoke his name. Disguised as a Congolese boy instead of a Tutsi, they crossed into Rwanda, where she delivered him safely to his mother. Miraculously, after four months, all of Mama Odia's children were returned to her. My eyes begin to tear. I look down at my own hands folded. I cannot look at her. I am wondering if Louis coming to America is the right thing. Where are we? What is happening? We have a son. Mama Odia speaks. My son can be stubborn. He can get angry. Please see that he attends church. She smiles as Louis translates reluctantly. Louis's father takes off a necklace he is wearing, hidden beneath his shirt. It is an ivory charm on a silver chain, an elephant. He places it in Brooke's hands. I've worn this around my neck ever since I left the Congo. It belonged to my father and his father. He then pulls out another ivory charm from his pocket, a turtle, and places it in my hand, closing my fingers around its finely etched body. We believe our ancestors come back to help us. He kisses my cheek three times and whispers the name of his eldest sister into my ear. Louis and his mother come up beside me. Mama Odia's eyes hold mine. I look to Louis and ask him if he will translate for me. Thank you for sharing your beautiful son with us, for trusting us. I promise you we will watch after him, take care of him, and see that he receives a good education. He will be part of our family and I believe that when he returns home to you, he will do great things for Rwanda. She nods, take my, takes my hand, and speaks. Louis listens to his mother and is silent for a few moments. She says, God loves my son more than I do. Finding beauty in a broken world is creating beauty in the world we find. Mosaics are created by hand. Louis Gakumba took my hand, and he is now our son. From Rwanda, he wrote, Everywhere you walk in the streets of Africa, you find many different kinds of glass, from broken bottles, good colors to see through. Believe me, nice things can be made from these bottles, cups, dishes too. What is broken can produce something new and important for the community. 
He goes on to say, street kids are not considered on the same level as others more fortunate. Sure, they're disappointed by life. On the other hand, people always talk that this generation is the one with future leaders inside. For some, yes. For others, no. Those in the street have no hope, no education. They're responsible for themselves. They do not think about what is going to happen. They only think about their daily bread. But they have minds, and they think, and they act. They are dying to be transformed. We all are. Shards of glass can cut and wound or magnify a vision. Mosaic celebrates brokenness and the beauty of being brought together. Our survival, the vitality of the planet, depends on mental flexibility and emotional acuity. Hands raised, hands put to work, we can improvise. We can create without a map, and we don't have to live in isolation. The gift of an attentive life is the ability to recognize patterns and find our way toward a unity built on empathy. Empathy becomes the path that leads us from the margins to the center of concern. The pattern is the thing. The beauty made belongs to everyone. We all bow. Finding beauty in a broken world becomes more than the art of assemblage. It is the work of daring contemplation that inspires action. And this one last story. I want to tell you a story, says Louis, as we sit on Mama Chakula's porch, where we met almost two years ago. There is a woman who was married to a pastor. It was a happy family. Some people say they were a family of six. Others say there were 11. The woman was away. And when she returned, she saw how the interhomway were butchering her children on the ground along with her husband. After the war, the man who murdered her family came back from the Congo, and when the Gachacha courts called him to explain what he had been accused of, he said, I accept everything I have been charged with, and from the depth of my heart, I apologize. The woman said, I saw everything. I know you killed my family. I loved my children and my husband. I am now alone. I have nothing. But I now choose to forgive you and take you into my home. You will live with me, and I will do whatever it takes to make you feel like my own son. Can you be in the same shoes with this woman, Louis asks. Louis then says, Rwanda is struggling with peace one person at a time. This is as hard as growing wheat on rock. We are finding our way toward unity and reconciliation on a walkway full of thorns, and we are walking barefoot. He stands up and walks over to the balcony that overlooks Kiseni into the Congo where he was born. We are trying to forgive, but to forgive is to forget, he says, and we cannot forget. Perhaps there is another word. I am searching for that word. Thank you. Yes, we're, uh, we're recording, so if you all would like to come up and ask a question, we'll just do it by whoever jumps up, and then um, we'll go from there. It's such an honor to have you here. We all, I'm sure, really enjoyed your reading. Um, both this afternoon and this evening, you spoke about the idea of community, and it seems to me in your writing, oftentimes you're re representing different environments and community. And I was wondering, as a spokesperson for those communities and those environments, how that's impacted your relationship with them and their relationship with you, 
and their reception of you? It's a great question, and thank you for your reading today. First of all, I would say I'm not a spokesperson for any community or anyone. I only speak out of my own experience and what I understand that to be. Um, In Mormon culture, it's problematic, um, and there have been costs and consequences. The political ones are easy to take. The personal ones are more difficult. Um, and I guess I'll just tell you a quick story, um, and I would ask that this not be recorded or posted anywhere because it's private, because it's private, because it's private, because it's private because it's private, because it's private, because it's private, because it's private.